Mr. Bear. So as I told you yesterday, I will not have time to go through in details on all the parts, but I will highlight the main points, okay? And I will ask you some questions to see if you have uh, well understood. Everybody's ready? We go? Okay, let's go for five, 50 minutes, okay. Chip, chip, chip. Okay, so an important step for optimization. So I just remind you the main algorithm you we use. We use uh, some variant of uh, gradient descent, which is presented by uh, these uh, equations. So the an important point is to initialize your weight. You remember that when you do back propagation, the first step is to do a forward pass. So you have your input, you do your forward pass, and you get your output, and you can compute your loss function. And based on your loss function, if your output is, your prediction is the current value, so is the meaning that your loss function is too big, and you want to minimize this loss function which measures the quality of your model. And to, to get some, uh, a better estimation, we do the back propagation to, to compute the derivative at each layer. But the first part is the forward pass. So it's really important when you do the forward pass, you need to have some initial value values for your weights. Make sense? So I hope you have read uh, this part. So if the weights are initialized to zero or the same constant for every uh, weight, so the weight, I remember, I remember you, the weight are there, 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 there. So for this simple example, we need to, to initialize this four values for uh, the weights. And based on the value of x1 and x2, and I will get an activation and so on and so on. But if you give the same constant value of every weight for, for example, the two uh, inputs, you will have something which is say identical, uh, you will have something symmetric. So you have in fact, the information of the activation one and activation two from this unit and this unit will give you the same information. So it's something symmetric. And in fact, when you will got to do the back propagation, you will have some same information. So we will not give some power to, to have some uh, good approximation function. And your deep neural network we start to, to try to find some optimization, but it will perform very poorly. So keep in mind that we have to do something uh, more clever. So don't never initialize your neural network to zero with the weight, but the bias is fine. The bias is always initialized to zero. So we need generally to do some random initialization to break the symmetry. Okay, but we need also to do something clever, not a high value of the weight and not a too uh, a low value of the weight. So the general practice, we will see these two more in, uh, in the practical, is to randomly generate from, oh, nice typo, randomly generate from a standard normal distribution. I forget to give you some announcement. So please, at the end of the, I, your job is to remind me, because I'm uh, like a, a godfish, to remind me to do some announcement at the end of the lecture, okay? Sure, somebody give me this, huh? At... okay. 
So, general properties, standard normal distribution. But from a two, uh, for deep neural network, we can have some potential uh, two issues, which is called the vanishing gradient. Vanishing gradient is the meaning that at one stage, your gradient started to be very, very small and then move. Or exploding gradient, which is the reverse. So we try to explain you some intuition of the vanishing gradient and which activation can lead to a vanishing uh, gradient uh, issue. So in fact, for some activation function, uh, you remember that when you do the back propagation, you at each step, you go backward. And as we use the chain rules, in fact, the gradient for each weight at each layer are multiplied each time. When you do the chain rule, you multiply the derivative by your function, multiply by the derivative which uh, the composition of the function and so on. So the derivative are multiplied. So if you have started by uh, a gradient which is lower than one, you multiply each time some gradient that lower than one, and it will be for deep uh, neural network, the first layer or the, the first uh, layers will be very, have uh, some gradient very small. So is what I'm writing here, the earlier layers are the slowest to train in such a case. You see the intuition of this? And in some worst case, in fact, your neural network will stop for training. And which cause this kind of uh, trouble sometimes is the sigmoid and the tan function. Why? Remember the shape of the sigmoid and the tan function? If you, the sigmoid is something like this and is, so in fact, when we have very uh, low value of uh, in X or high value in X, it will be something on the plateau. So the derivative will be zero. So if your weight are large, the gradient will be, be very small. It's level out when weight go to infinity. Yes, if your weight go very uh, high, you will have something like with if you use a tan or the sigmoid, you will have something close to one with the plateau and with the derivative is equal to one to zero. So to uh, overcome this, uh, this issue, most of the time, in fact, we use the ReLU function. So the ReLU function in hidden layer, as the ReLU function, remember the shape of the ReLU function is zero and after is x, is like this. So in fact, the derivative uh, inside it will be one. Because this is X, so the derivative is one. So it will be not cancel your gradient when you multiply. Okay, but some people tell me, can tell me, oh yes, but if you have some negative value, you will have a gradient to zero, which is called the dead uh, value. So of course, if you have some negative value on your weight, too much negative value, the linear combination will be negative and the value will be equal to zero. And so the derivative will be equal also to zero. So is the reason that also you can uh, use the uh, leak value. Okay, so this, we will investigate this during the PROC with the initialization of the weight. So the other uh, trouble which can happen is exploding gradient. So is the meaning that is the opposite if the gradient will be 
too high. It will completely explode. And you can have at the end, as just white, but you can have some overflow. So happening if, for example, if you initialize your weight with some two uh, big numbers and you do the, the forward pass and you will have something very high. And so when you will go back, your derivative will be also back. You will have some huge step, in fact. You saw the change. In fact, it will start to have a gradient with oscillating every time. So it will be not too good. So all of this to say that the solution is for network not too deep, we use the ReLU of the LiPoLU, which can a little bit robust to the vanishing exploded gradient, but it could happen that even with the ReLU and LiPoLU, you can have uh, some uh, trouble. And the heuristic which have been used uh, is to draw from a normal distribution with this variance. So the weight of this variance and the variance is depending of K and K will depend of the kind of activation function you use. So if you use the ReLU activation, K is equal to two. And if you use the tan hyperbolic K equal to one, and this is called the Xavier initialization. So you will see this Xavier initialization and you go, you can uh, check some paper on this on some software. And ML minus one, you remember what is ML minus one? If somebody can tell me what is ML minus one? Yes, size of the layer M, uh, L minus one. Yes, is, uh, yep. And another heuristic is this normal distribution with this variance, which is to divide by the sum of the, the size of ML is, yes, but you got it. You know what is ML. Okay. Okay, so something more interesting now is yesterday I told you that we, we I show you an example that if we add with the logistic model, it was a linear uh, boundary decision. But as soon we add a layer, a higher layer, we have something which is a nice shape of the boundary, something uh, non-linear. So this is the fact that we have a nice theorem that tell you that the approximation property of the multi-layer perceptron. So the universal approximator is saying that a two-layer network, so a two-layer network, remember, how many hidden layers in a two-layer network? Yes, one. So a two layer network is a meaning you have your input, one hidden layer and the output. So with a two layer network with linear output can uniformly approximate any continuous function on the compact input domain to arbitrary accuracy. So it's very powerful and with this, this C in action. So is a meaning that this result hold if you have some activation function which are non-linear. So if you have any activation function, like we have seen logistic, tan, relu, or even the sinus, the cosinus, the exponential, anything non-linear, which is not polynomial, you can approximate any <coughs> uh, non-linear function from the input to the output. And this, I suggest you this nice paper is a little bit technical and I just will highlight the main point of this paper today, which exposed uh, this point. 
So in this uh, graphic from Bishop, Bishop uh, Pattern Organization, so is a book is Pattern Organization and Machine Learning. I also advise this nice book. It doesn't present uh, too much the neural network, but is more about machine learning and pattern recognition. It's a very nice book. And he put this example. So this example, you have simulated 50 data points in minus one one. So the blue data points are simulated. And a two layer, so one hidden layer with a, a linear activation, the tan hyperbolic activation function with just three, 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 three units. So is the meaning you have one input, three neuron. We have this network and the link between X and y, we know the true link is that y equal to the absolute value of x. And so you see the data point and you try to recover this point. Yes, so here is just the, is, is a good point. Uh, linear activation, so is the meaning that in this part, each activation is a tan, but for this combination, it's just linear. All good, Len? So it's a good point. Yes, okay, so on this setup, it shows this, this picture. So this line and this line are the activation function from the output. So you combine this and you got this good approximation. It's quite nice. And if you do this, uh, it did also with the square, another function, similar. You manage to get very the, the shape of the square. And with the sinus, it's working also. And uh, again, the value absolute, the absolute value. And also uh, from this uh, AV side, uh, uh, function. So the function is a step function. So, so is, is zero and as soon as positive is one. So for this function too, he managed to get with this simple network to approximate. So is a meaning that after, if you can think that the mapping from X to Y is any combination of this function is you have the intuition that for any uh, two layers network, you can be able to uh, approximate the mapping from X to Y. So when I saw this, I say, oh, it's quite good. But you need to be always criticism when you, you read some, some things. So I say, okay, I will program it, we will try it. Okay. Uh, a non-continuous function. Uh, yep, good point. Mm, we don't have this uh, result. Non-continuous, we, we cannot show that is, uh, you can approximate. It's a good point. So this is a, is a, is a theorem which have been shown by this uh, author in 1993. So is a reply to your question, Joshua. So if you have a function from K, uh, so a compact set in RM, which going to R, so is a continuous function, any continuous function. And if you use uh, an activation function, which is nonlinear, which is, which is phi here, you have this uh, that for any epsilon uh, greater than zero, you have with an integer n, which is a number of hidden unit and parameter. Oh, I put a v, but yes, v, b, 
which such that you have this approximation. So it's, very, it's quite nice. Okay, do you trust me or you don't trust me? So what I've seen, I say, okay, I will just show this in action. So this in action, if you open, hmm, I will try to open. Okay, if I'm doing done, and if I do open illustration ability there, so I say, okay, I will try it. I did my experiment. So the first, don't worry, some people who doesn't know R, I don't, we don't care. So I did exactly the, the, the experiment that has done uh, Bishop, okay? So you can start the beginning, I simulate some data from uniform minus one to one and I, I simulate 50 points. I think, yes, you're right. You will be less than epsilon, you're right. Sorry. Typo. Thanks, Joshua. And after I use the package Keras, you will use tomorrow uh, with Python and some people in R. And in this simple code, I just, you can see in the simple code, uh, layer dense unit three, activation 10H, you see it? Make sense? Second layer, which is the output, is I put linear and I optimize with the MSC. So is the meaning, uh, my metric is the MSC and I use like the loss function, the square, uh, square loss. Everybody got it? It's okay. Mm. And so I, I simulate this and I plot the result on the loss and the MSE, and I plot the fitted. It's working well. So you can reproduce this. And after I did the same with the absolute value, just to play around. Ah, so this is during my training. You can see the loss function, which, and with you have in the x axis, you have the epoch. Everybody know what is the epoch? You should be comfortable with the epoch. Okay, wait. Okay, everybody who was in the chat, be careful, math. X2 is polynomial, but I say for the activation function, not for the true function. The true function can be x square. The x square we can approximate x square by non-activation function, which is not polynomial. It's just the activation function should be not polynomial. Make sense, Matt, it's clear this? Yeah, yeah, I realize, sorry about that. No, no, it's not a, don't be sorry, never be sorry. It's just to clarify for everybody. Okay, and uh, yes, Kuang, uh, one scan through entire data. Yes, the epoch is like, an epoch is a meaning that if you have used some mini batch, uh, you have, uh, if you cut, if your mini batch, for example, you have your data set and your mini batch is cutting in four, is a meaning you have seen the four mini batch. You have seen the full uh, data, one epoch. Okay. So this, I did this. And of course, you can see that for the absolute value, as is not derivable. Uh, at to zero, you will not get exactly the, this, uh, the peak, the angle. You will not get exactly the angle, but you approximate quite well. If I run more uh, longer my uh, neural network, it works. So I also try the sinus and the sinus works also very well. All good? All good. Okay, back. So this, it was a good point to, to see this. I hope you like this because I was, uh, I play wrong. And now the second point still there. Sorry for this, I come back. So this now, this is very important, very good point. Okay, so now, 
nice paper too, technical, but nice paper is the one I put it in Lean and Tegmark 2016. So why deep neural network? Why you use deep neural network? So this result is quite pretty good. You will see why it's working. Okay, continuous multiplication gate. I try to be very clear to this point. I like this point. Okay, if I have two input x1 and x2, and if I want to compute x1 multiplied by x2 times x2, in fact, a neural network with only four hidden units can model a multiplication of two numbers. You can say, oh, why is this full? We see. So with the meaning, if I want to compute x1 and x2 by using a neural network, in fact, with this neural network, in this paper, they show that for four activation function f and some specific weight, you can approximate the multiplication of x1 times x2. Okay, you this keep in mind this any multiplication of two input can be approximated by just four hidden units. You put this in the side, and now we're back. So now consider that I have, instead of two input, I have an input which is 1000, 1000 the dimension of my feature. So it's a meaning I have 1000 features. Yes, is this for any non-polynomial F? True, activation function, yes, okay? So keep in mind, 1,000 features, output Y. Now, if I want to use a regression model, okay, I can do a regression model. So I write this regression model. Look at this regression model. So I want to build a model to represent the quadratic relation between X and Y. So I put quadratic relation so I want to have something like a polynomial. So I try to, I can build a regression model and to, to, to build some new features. So my new uh, features, x tilde, okay. what it is is x1 square, x1 multiplied by x2 and so on, all the interaction. So my features now is expanded and I have all these features. So I have finally all this weight. So in this model, it's just a quadratic model. I haven't done any neural network, it's a quadratic model. I need for this model to representing a quadratic model with all these features, 500,000 parameters. Make sense? All good at this stage, just a linear model, but you put some square all the interaction. Okay, I keep going, try to be clear. Now I want to do this by my neural network. We have said just before that to get one multiplication, I need four neurons, okay? But in this model, I have, if I want to represent all the possible uh, square relation, I need 5,000, 500,000 parameters. So if I do a neural network, I need four times because four is give me the x1, x2 or x1, x3 and so on. There are no pattern is x1 is all the the multiplication x1 multiplied by x1, x1 multiplied by x2, x1 multiplied by x3, x1 multiplied by x4, and so on. All the two by two interaction. This is my model. Okay, so now in this neural network, everybody agree with what I written is that I need this number of units. So two billion parameters. 
for doing the same as the uh, linear model with the square. Make sense? So in terms of part of weight, so this is uh, the number of weight is 1000 for this number of unit and after this number of weight because I have this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. So I count all these arrows. So this is the number of parameters for doing this model. At this stage, you say, oh, I'm not impressed. Not so good. Okay, but wait a minute. You will be impressed. So, okay, this model is quite complex, but now I will re build my goal, my task to build a model to representing the quadratic relation between X and Y, but I can consider that only 10 of the regressor are in importance. I don't know which one, but I, I consider that I just have 10 regressor of importance. So I have just 10, my regressors are xi multiplied by xj are in importance. Just 10 are in importance. If I want to use a linear quadratic model, this is still the same model because I don't know which one are in importance. So if I want to run this model, I need still have the same number of parameters, even if I just only 10 are useful. Agree at this point? Clear, not clear? I want one clear, two clear. You get the, set, the setting of my point? Oh, nobody replied. Yes, clear, thanks. Okay, so now back to the business and this you will say, oh, this is good. Remind, reminder that for doing any multiplication, I need four units. As we have just 10 regressors as useful, I just need four times 10 units. So I just need in my parameter, come on, Richard. If somebody can reply to Richard, why four? I think Richard, I'm just kidding. Eh? You just mm -hmm. wake up now. No, I just joined in like two minutes ago, so I'm not. Ah, sure. yes. Okay, yeah. so check the, 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 this one. Ah, thank you. Okay, so we are just setting that for any multiplication of two numbers, we need, we have this nice result, we just need four units, four neurons for multiplication of two. Thank you. So here, yeah. the theorem, thanks Joshua, the theorem. Okay, <laughs> we're kidding we shout. <laughs> okay, so we have just four times 10 units, okay? So in this first hidden layer, I just need 40 uh, units. These 40 units, as I have still uh, my 1000 uh, features, I need, in fact, this number of parameters for the weight, for all this, uh, the first arrow here, the here, 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 all this arrow. And after I need also 40 more because I have this combination of this arrow there. Make sense? So still, you can see that my regression, it was this number of parameters, and now I just need this number of parameters. Quite good. No, you're not impressed. So why is, yes, don't need the bias. The square root, you don't need the bias, but if you put a bias, it will be just uh, 40, 40 more. Okay. So now we say, okay, so it's quite not nice for the quadratic, but why deep? Okay, why deep? Deep is when you start it to be deep, so you add more layer, you have a capability to have a model more complex. So you leverage the complexity of your model. So for example, 
consider that I want to build some model with a polynomial of degree 1000. It's a lot. Or to get this. So what do you think? Why I put 250 for, for 1000 unit? Or to get 1000. So my point is I just keep 250 product because I say maybe I just did 250. So 250 product is a meaning that I have x1, x2 relevant, x1, x3, and so on. Yes. So this is a meaning I have 250 product for this one. So at this one, at this stage, first hidden, I managed to get a polynomial, polynomial of degree two. Make sense? So this first hidden layer give me a polynomial of degree two with 250 product. Okay, which is the degree of the polynomial when I do two hidden layer like this. Yes, so two power two. So this one will be two power three. This one, two power four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there I am, I'm two power 10. How much is two power 10? Yes, so it's a meaning that with 10 hidden layer, I managed to get a complexity of to represent a mapping with a polynomial of degree more than 1000. Make sense? So now I hope you have the intuition that when we had some hidden layer, you leverage the habit capability and the capacity of you to your model to approximate a more complicated uh, mapping from X to Y. So for this, uh, this one is this number of parameter. And if I want to use a linear variation, you can see the comparison with this number of parameter. There are no comparison. No question of this part? 250 to adjust, I consider that I have not all the interaction are relevant and I just keep 250 product. I don't know which one, but because if my neural network, we put some way to equal to zero, I don't care. Can somebody, yes, thanks. Thanks, Matthew, to explain to Jade. Okay. Pretty good, pretty good. 10.40, we finish the second lecture. <laughs> Take a message of the second lecture. Click, click, click. So I check, checking, checking. You'll be comfortable of these four points. Okay, now we have some points to see today. So the first part, part in 10 minutes, it will be very hard. I wanted to talk about the dropout. So it's about the overfitting. Just keep in mind what is the overfitting. I hope that everybody know what is the overfitting. The overfitting happen when you, for example, in neural network, you train your loss function just only on the training set. So you, as we have seen that the approximation theorem give you that for any uh, no, uh, mapping from X to Y, we can approximate by a neural network. So of course, if you do a neural network and you just use your training set, your neural network will completely uh, approximate well your, out, your output. So is the reason why, uh, if you read this, I will not go to, to, to go on this because I'm not, too much time, but okay, I will I give you this, this intuition. 
Okay, I give you this intuition is in the bishop. So in this bishop uh, book, <laughs> I have the true function is this function. And I have just 10 points. This is a true function. And I build some model. Not neural network, just to understand the overfitting. I build some model, some polynomial model of order 0, 1, 3, 9, which looks the best. Three, why? Okay, we just say three, same shape, yes, but the same shape, and you can think that you don't have the green. The green is a true one, you don't have the green, you have just a point. So you can say, oh, maybe it's approximate well the point, but the nine go directly on the point. And this is my point on the point, is <laughs> because it's going directly on the point because The line stale close to, yes. The nine, yes, of course, is over 15 because it really give the perfect prediction, the point, but it will be not good for generalize. And this is a is a important point. If you compute the uh, uh, mean square error on the training set, you can see that in here is the complexity of my model. As my complexity of my model increase, uh, my uh, root mean square error, my quality is going down, down, down. But if I use on the training, on the test set, so some data I haven't seen, you know, it's, it's getting better, better. And as soon up, it explodes. So at this part, you can see this started to be bad. So is the reason why and I just finished, the nine is overfitting. But this is my point. You have understood what is overfitting. My second point is this point. Overfitting problem become less severe as the size of the data set increase. I have done the same experiment, but with 100 points. And the red is a polynomial of degree nine. But it looks like the polynomial of degree three because I have more data point. So keep in mind that that the overfitting problem, if you have a lot, a lot, a lot of data, you will have less trouble on your overfit uh, or the overfit uh, issue. Okay, so you will see this. Uh, we do this in tomorrow in the park. So. And as Sarah told you this, I think uh, on the lecture, and I remember I was listening very carefully what he was saying, Sarah, he did well. So during your, your training process of the neural network, in fact, you have two curves and you optimize the loss function based on the training data. So for example, you have your training error, which is the um, plain line here. You can see this. And it started to be training iteration. So you have your optimization is getting better and better. But you don't want to stop here. You don't want to take the weight from this point. Why? Because it's very good for the training data set, but it's not good for the data you haven't seen. So in fact, when you you hold another data, which is in the validation set. And you, at each iteration, you also evaluate the prediction error on the validation set. And as soon as these two curves go, uh, the validation set starting to increase and still the training error starting to uh, keep going to, to decrease, you stop. In fact, your result, you want to have your result there. Makes sense? And in chaos, we have this kind of parameter we see tomorrow, which is called patience. So I will not do this demo because I don't have to do this demo. And I say more during the tutorial. And so keep in mind that for 
neural network, we split our data in three. We have the training data, the validation data, and the test data. So during the optimization process, we use the training data and the validation data. The test data, we don't touch the test data. So the training data and the validation data are using during the optimization for choosing show, show, the best hyperparameter uh, of your, uh, your model. Okay? So training data is used for the training model. Validation data is to use to choose between different settings of your model. So we have different settings, the learning rate, the, the drop pod parameter, some um, number of layer and some number of units and so on. And based on the validation data, you will choose uh, the best model. And for the last model you have chosen, you can evaluate the performance uh, with the test data. Always like this. Most of the time, you don't say, never say always. Okay. To overcome the overfitting problem, we have seen on the lecture two that if we use some regularization, like a kind of rich regression, remember, on your, um, you want to optimize your loss function, and instead to optimize just only your loss function, you add a regularization term. And we have seen that the regularization term give us, which is called the weight dec decay. So I hope you're comfortable to the weight decay. So most of the time we can penalize by the L2 norm of the L1 norm, but the most popular is the L2 norm during the, uh, the deep learning. And I wanted to go to the point, which is, uh, I, I will get still five minutes, if not five minutes, is not enough to understand completely the drop out. So maybe I will explain, I will ask uh, uh, Yoni and Sarah to explain it a bit more, the, the drop out during the PROC. Uh, or we'll come back on the on this on the chapter six, maybe. So the dropout is quite uh, famous and is well, uh, I've been developed in 2014 in this paper. I will recommend also the lecture of this paper, the reading of this paper. The idea of the dropout is to, to draw from a, a random probability P, like a, a coins, and you will put some weight to inactive some, um, some uh, neuron during the, uh, the learning process. And that you do this randomly. So you have this network, for example, to train. And instead to train this, the dropout is a kind of regularization technique during the training, uh, uh, training process. You draw randomly drop unit. So I put a picture, and so you flip the coins with a probability P, and for each unit, and you uh, drop this unit for the learning process. So it's a meaning that you put, is the same uh, intuition that the way decay. Instead to, to put a lot of influence to all the unit at each time, because maybe you will, you will be uh, overfit your training data, you sometimes put to zero. So you shrink your weight as the L2 norm is doing. You shrink your weight. So here you shrink your weight completely to zero. But this is done at each iteration. So is the meaning that at each iteration, for example, first train iteration, I don't use the uh, this neuron. I don't use this neuron, this neuron, this neuron, this neuron, this neuron. And I'm doing uh, an iteration of my optimization uh, uh, algorithm. Second iteration, I do again the dropout technique. So maybe it will be this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and so on and so on. So in fact, at each time, 
he doesn't uh, use every time the, the, all the neuron, all the units. And when I finish my, uh, my learning process, at the test time, I use all the units. But to have a good position, I multiply each uh, weight by the probability uh, to be uh, dropped. And on the so why is working this idea? Do you get the process? Uh, I can explain uh, slowly if you didn't get the process because uh, it doesn't make any sense to go too fast if we don't understand. Did you get the intuition of the dropout? Clear, Alex, I like you, it's clear. <laughs> P is a probability to be dropped. Okay. So in fact, this idea, the intuition why is work. Ah, P is positive to keep. So P is positive to keep. Okay, we check. Oh, is zero is P or one minus P? I don't know. Is the it doesn't make a, as is a tuning parameter, but is okay, you you will see. It's just a tuning parameter, so it's P or one on his P. Yes, but okay, 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 okay. No, it's not important. Matthew, very good point. Matthew has uh, given a very good point. Because as a test set, in fact, I just put this as to understand the concept. I explained, Matthew why we don't need to know exactly because in fact in the or is um, if you go to this slide the current implementation is scale the factor p during the training and the testing so is the meaning or instead to multiply at the end by p because some people can use your net network at the end also you don't need to this is multiply at the beginning is is the is scaled by one over p. So at the end, if you multiply by p, is equal to 1. So you don't need to, to take care about this. Make sense? So the current implementation is like this. OK. So I just explained the addition why it's working. So the dropout can be viewed as an ensemble member. You know what is the ensemble method? The ensemble method in statistics, in machine learning, is to use many, many, many models. And the best prediction, in fact, is not doing by one model, is to do the average of all your prediction, all your models. So you, you have an ensemble of models, you have a prediction for each model, and at the end, you combine all your models, you take the average, and you have the prediction. This is the idea of the ensemble method principle. So I say is exploit multiple learning models to obtain the better prediction performance. And the dropout can be viewed as an ensemble methods, because in fact, you have different models. But we have some approximation to understand how it's working. So I'll let you read uh, the end of uh, why it's working for the overfitting. And I suggest you for tomorrow, your work is to go through this slide and to see also the importance of which you wanted because we see tomorrow, most which is important is a batch normalization. I didn't get time to get the batch normalization, but this was has been a big, big step in machine learning, uh, the batch normalization. So it's the meaning that you normalize your data, not at the beginning also, but after each layer. And this has been introduced in 2015. And thanks to this idea of batch normalization after each layer, it uh, enables the community to go deeper and deeper and deeper on the neural network. Because before it was a little bit stuck, and now we can go deeper and deeper because this is help a lot the optimization process. So keep in mind this uh, batch normalization. 
Okay, I need to give you some uh, some announcement, uh, and after I reply to your question, and after we go to bed. Okay, so announcement. Oh, where well, I put the announcement of uh, Yoni? He sent me something today. Uh, any question? You, so you receive an email from Yoni today? Or from uh, Sarat? Yes or not? You receive on Canvas? So some announcement that tomorrow you have the PROAC. So as we have done the first time, we will be split in three groups. One group with uh, Yoni, one group with me, and one group with Sarat. Sarat is here. Hi, Sarat. Hi, Benoit. Uh, nice to see you. So you, normally, you should have all the uh, the link for tomorrow. And what you have to do is to get the link. For example, for my group, I put the link of the HTML file, and you have also the R code. So you have the R code, the script, and the HTML file. Okay, Sarah is, is checking. So you have to do the same also for the Julia and for the Python. So you you will be ready tomorrow uh, on your computer, ready to go. Okay. Yeah, small correction. Like for Python and uh, Julia, there is no separate HTML file. Uh, they have this Google Colab or Jupyter Notebook. Yes, so they are, they are more advanced than uh, our user. Our yeah, user. We, are, we are superior. Superior, I don't know it's superior. Okay, we need to do a, at the end, of, we maybe do a challenge between the three groups. <laughs> <laughs> See who is faster with a simple example. It would be nice, you know, like a game like this, huh? by group. We can think about this. On the yeah. last uh, tutorial, no? yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> group twenty minutes, everybody, and up, come back together. Okay, so and you have the reading uh, to do uh, for Monday, for the two hours lecture for the convolutional neural network. Uh, you should uh, read the section five point one, five point two, and five point three, and you want you have to watch uh, some uh, few link uh, videos uh, in the section. So the material for 5.4 until 5.10 will be online on Monday. Okay. And where can I get links for tomorrow? Okay. Yoni is uploading after this uh, lecture is done. Okay. So the link will be uploaded after the lecture. Okay. And, uh, and the homework for will be online at the end of the weekend. And the first assignment have been uh, the marking has been uh, already started, and I think you did a good job. Huh? And no stress for the for the quiz. So you need to do to to do your summary of uh, two side uh, A four pages to do the quiz. Okay. Okay, where can I give the link and check? Okay, cool, thanks. Okay, and ah 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 What is a ah shade? What is a ah I don't see the ah ah. Sorry, I was laughing at your at your joke. Ah, it's good. It's good. Somebody laugh at my joke. It's good. Okay, good. One hour, good. Oh, will be uploaded. The answer, as I believe, is not quite the same format as assignment. Christina asked a question to everyone. I think Sarah will reply because I'm very bad for this. No, I keep this question to Yoni. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, uh, giving answers separately. This there are three languages involved. I don't think that's uh, appropriate. I believe tutor will make some uh, comments on the assignment and might give feedback. Okay. I don't know, but I'll discuss with you on it. What is the possible? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Any question? 
Oh, so we're going to drop out. Do we remember the weight? Uh, regarding the robot, do we remember the weight that are dropped so they can be updated in the future? No. Is uh, randomly each time. You can be dropped. Uh, a weight can be you know, it's just uh, randomly. No, I mean if the weights are trained um, in one iteration, do we remember those trained weights for a future iteration if they're kept? Okay, so I okay your weights. You do an iteration, okay? You do your your a full iteration, so forward, backward, okay? As a forward, you put some weight zero. Up, backward, okay, so this weight has been zero, it doesn't move. Second iteration, you you are back after the first iteration and after you do again the dropout mm -hmm. and again. I replied to the question, I didn't reply to uh, the All the weights reset then at the start of each iteration? Not reset. He's, he's, no, it's not reset. It's he, not reset, it's like he's uh, in the, he's, um, he's the optimization process. So if co consider that you have to 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 wait, so you try to optim optimize uh, the uh, the loss function you want to be done, okay, mm -hmm. with some weight values, and you do an iteration as usual, yeah. but sometimes just the weight are equal to zero at at one uh, step, but it's so you remember the step of the gradient is. The, the previous weight minus the learning rate mm -hmm. multiplied by the gradient. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you update, you still giving like this, but sometimes the weight is equal to zero at one pass, but it's, and it keep going. It's not a new model starting to zero. It's, it's a good point. It's not a new model starting to zero. It's the same, it's during the process. The weight are put to equal to zero. So the so the weight for that unit is so that unit is not used in that iteration, but yes. the weight that had previously been trained for it is recorded and can be used in future iterations if that unit is not dropped. Yes, exactly. Good, good. good. Do you, do you multiply it by one on p after each iteration then? No. It shouldn't. But shouldn't you? Shouldn't you have to like normalize it back? After each, um, like each time you run a batch, though. Ah, you have the, the batch normalization after each. We see tomorrow the batch normalization, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't use the the fact that you have dropped or not dropped. Okay. Is is in, is influence okay. inside, but we don't need to 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 think about this because it's equal to zero. You take all the all your your output when you do the normalization. And it's like uh, when you go from uh, one uh, uh, after one uh, hidden layer, you have some output. Is this output is as the first input for another one? So you do the normal the batch normalization for this output. Okay. Yeah. Is a value not but, so not the weight. so the term the terms that you don't drop out for say one of the models. At the end of that process, you don't multiply them by one on P before you start the next set of dropout. No. Before you no. do the next dropout. No, no. Oh, okay. It's just as a, as a. Wouldn't that be? Wouldn't they be too large then for like for the next model? Like if you just use the the previous ones, not the weights. Yeah, look, uh, maybe a uh, uh, I mean a some. Okay. I just want to really understood your question, so I was just looking at my, my yeah. uh, I think that's what Christina and Jade were saying as well. Yeah, okay. So maybe I'm confused. Uh, confused. Uh, there's a scaling, but, but your weight are multiplied by one over p each time but it's at what stage in the process during the training because at the beginning oh, just to just yeah. to, 
I just wanted to just to, to give you the process that I tell you that you uh, you drop with the power ATP or you keep with the power ATP and you don't do anything, you don't compute. And at the end, you need to multiply every weight by P. But instead to do this, in fact, internal, they multiply by one over P and you don't do anything at the end. So yeah. this is at the end of each iteration, like Joshua was saying? You don't do anything at the end of each iteration. It's during the iteration, your weight are multiplied by one divided by P. Okay, I can uh, I can read again and more explanation if you want uh, to more on Friday to be very clear. Okay. So Benoit, like I want to have an intuition for this dropout. Yes. Isn't it uh, same as, uh, um, so if you think of, uh, there are only two weights when you drop out uh, W1 and there is a W2. You yes. walk in the direction of W2 in one iteration. Yes. And in other iterations, you walk in a different direction. It's like, you know, you're walking restricted to certain dimensions by dropping out. Is that the right intuition? Yes, exactly. Yeah. You got the good, uh, good point. You got the point of Sarat? Krishna? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, like uh, we saw you walking on theta's plane, right? In our uh, optimization chapter. So you walk in some dimensions in some iterations and uh, uh, like, you know, depending on what dropout. So you restrict uh, your uh, direction uh, by doing that. And well, that makes sense. Thank you. Yes, good point. Just good to, to explain like this. Uh, EcoP is freely available on what? There is a question about a uh, uh, way to find a mathematical proof for why having more data would reduce overfitting. I think uh, Dirk's book has a good uh, simple analysis. Yeah, OK. Okay. But I, I really recommend the, the book of uh, the book is good, but the, the book where I show uh, the plot and all of this with the um, polynomial, the bishop, uh, the pattern of recognition and machine learning is pretty good. Book. Sure, sure, yeah, that is also good. And I think is uh, is freely available on on the net. I got the PDF uh, very easily. Is it in the references? Sorry. Is it in the references? Or have you listed? Uh, I will check it out. Yes, we okay. will put on, on the on the on the list. Does doing dropout um, make your algorithm like more um, more likely uh, to have um, like problems with overflow because like the parameters are getting larger, so it'd be like more subject to. Um, uh, the exploding um yes in yeah. fact is is really uh i've been really used and uh is is not always uh better and huh? we see tomorrow on the the influence of the dropout we try the dropout tomorrow in the park to see the yeah. influence so sometimes it's improved sometimes not but is he has been uh, shown that is help for uh, uh, against the overfitting problem. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah. On the paper, they explain this and they give some experiment with uh, some different value of the dropout. Okay. Thanks. I think it's time to go, huh? Bye, Benoit. Well. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. <Arthur. laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> See you guys. Yes, I have another meeting, in fact. Okay, thanks, 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 thanks. Okay, uh, French, something French, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tomorrow you need to, to learn more, something more on Merci. Yeah? <laughs> oh, my, very good. No, 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 a la semaine prochaine. Tomorrow. Ah, maybe Jade, Jade is not doing R, maybe. What is your language, Jade? 
Which language is... Uh, no, je suis... Ah, Python. Okay. So, see you next week. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, she'll be with me tomorrow. So. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, the R addict, see you tomorrow. Yeah. And Python addict, see you Sarat. And Julia, nobody's doing Julia, but it's okay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, need... <laughs> you have some people, Julia. <laughs> you will be listening to this lecture later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs> From Google Translate, it's good to use Google Translate. <laughs>